Brother Dan over here, if he would open our service in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to gather together in this place to worship you, praise you, and listen to your word. We ask that you open our hearts and our minds as the word Pastor, My, uh, Pastor Matt brings to us, and uh, this, we enjoy this day and chance to worship you. Thank you for this time and this beautiful day that we see, and our fellowship we have here together, and for those listening at home, bless them and have the message reach them too. And please uh, be with everyone who was not able to make it today, or those that are here that are still dealing with health issues. Bless them, encourage them, and give them strength. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Dan. Our next Christmas carol is The First Noel, which was written hundreds of years ago as a way to express the excitement and wonder of Christmas. Noel means Christmas in French, so it's about the very first Christmas when Jesus was born. chapter 1 and verse 23 it says this behold a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel which means God with us so let's lift it up this morning on this beautiful chorus Emmanuel all together
at this time, before Pastor Matt comes with this morning's message, Dan is going to come here and read a letter from one of our missionaries. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, this is a message from John and Tammy Cooley from Jamaica. Uh, this is uh, uh, their most recent uh, Note, note that they sent to us. Um, so uh, th this event it talks about here, I think the beginning part is already done, but it says, after months of hard labor, the concrete floors have finally been poured in the church house. We'll be cleaning up the aftermath of the contractor's work during a church weekday this coming weekend. We'll be looking into what updates are needed on the electrical system over the next few days. We have a new roof. We're just a new roof from having the house livable. So this is their pastor's, um, the new pastor's house that they're working on. They'll be painting other cosmetic things, but Pastor Smith and his family should be able to occupy the home once the roof has been completed. So, praise the Lord, they just need a roof over their heads, right? Um, in new news, we announced to the church but Sunday before last, we decided to move up the date of our turning the church over to Pastor Smith and walking away to April of 2024. So, this is their plan to move and have the local pastor take over the church. But to make a long story short, the last month, couple months have been made clear as long as we're at the church, the members will be content to permit us to carry the burden of ministry, but it's simply time for them to take responsibility for the work on Jamaican leadership. Uh, so they're going to leave them with a pastor and uh, the paperwork and finances ready uh, and a livable house for their pastor. But that said, their announcement led to, that announcement led to a proposal by the nephew of one of the church's members. He's a British developer who's in the process of establishing a new community just outside the city of Maypen, about 40 minutes from Mandeville. Maypen itself seems to be in a real state of growth, with a new small mall and several more modern stores having been constructed. When he learned of our decision, he expressed to his aunt that he had a lot of confidence in us and that he would like for us to consider establishing a church in the community for which land has already been designated. So as they understand it, there'll be no cost for the land, but they would like him to consider establishing the church with the aim of establishing a private Baptist school and further down the road a retirement again, all under the Baptist umbrella. So God opens new doors all the time. And every home will, of course, be new. The residents will be the kind of Jamaicans who can afford to live in an exclusive gated community, which will also eventually include a clubhouse and other amenities. And so there'll be working families to reach looking for a private school for their children. So it's the kind of opportunity that they have not heard of in Jamaica, and the developer invited them to be the ones to take advantage of it. So a blessing. Amazing opportunity, too, for a young missionary couple. So Tammy and I will love to partner with a couple that has a full missionary career ahead of them. With the understanding establishing this one church would likely be at least a seven-year or maybe ten-year project. So you can see the kind of investment that those missionaries make, too. It would be a very ambitious project. So we require a courageous and ambitious young couple who are well-trained, patient, and prepared to take on new and unexpected challenges. And then it says they'll share more as they learn more. But uh, we definitely can ask for prayers to be with them on that transition to the Pastor Smith and his family and to this new opportunity they have. So that's from John and Tammy Cooley out of Jamaica. And uh, just God's giving blessings all around. <laughs> Thank you. And now Pastor Mel. Amen. Well, the Bible says where there is no vision, the people perish. Amen. Praise God for our missionaries that have a vision for God's people and doing those things that God would have them to do. So this morning, we're going to turn our Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter number 9. 2 Samuel chapter number 9. The title of today's message is The Kindness of God. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, You are so very kind, so very good to us, so very long-suffering to us, Lord. We pray that You would meet with us here this morning. Help us to glean those things from Your Word that You have for us. Lord, may You protect those that are traveling. May You heal those that are not feeling well. And may You meet with us here this morning, Lord, as we have come to meet with You. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, just...
of a couple of announcements this morning. Um, we are still continuing on with our Bible reading challenge. So we'd love to hear from you how many chapters you have read in the Bible this last week. We've got our little silver bucket back there in the back with some pieces of paper and a pen. You can jot that down. It's been very encouraging seeing all the chapters of God's Word that um, we've been reading here in Anaheim. Thankful that you guys are involved with that. And then also... We have a special gift for the king, and we've had this in the last several uh, bulletins, and we do have a special offering um, for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So this would be above and beyond our normal giving and our normal tithes and offerings. Um, Just pray that you would uh, ask God if he would have you to participate in this and what part he would have you to play in it. We plan to use the money that comes in for the gift for the king to go towards purchasing a a camera, camera security system for the church grounds here, as well as going for gifts and love offerings for our missionaries. And uh, this time of year for our missionaries is normally a little more difficult um, as they go through this Christmas holiday and the birth of Jesus Christ. A lot of folks, we think about our families, don't we? And uh, praise God that He sent His only begotten Son to this earth uh, for us, right? Amen. But you know what, as human beings, we can get a little discouraged as well this time of year if we're not near our family. And I would say, don't do that. Do not be discouraged. Praise God for bringing His Son uh, to this earth. And then also, special announcement for next week's service. Next week, Sunday, falls on Christmas Eve. We will have our regular meeting time for Sunday school at 945, as well as our regular 1030 a.m. service. And we will not be having our evening service so that you will be able to enjoy the rest of the evening. Um, Some folks like to travel and go see family and friends for the evening and give you the the opportunity to do that without being pressed uh, too greatly. So that's next Sunday, only a morning Sunday school and the main service. And then uh, at the end of the month, as we fall between uh, Christmas and New Year's, on Saturday the 30th of December, we will be having our all-church breakfast. So if you're not traveling uh, to go see family and friends and you're available to come out at 9 a.m. for our all-church breakfast, we'd love to have you. It's a great time of fellowship and a great time of food as well there at the uh, diner. And so uh, what a privilege we have to come and gather in his house. Amen. And so very thankful for how good God is to us. And, you know, I want us to consider as we approach the end of the year as well, um, we will be observing um, the Lord's Supper, communion. Um, That'll happen on Christmas Eve. Um, We do uh, observe this ordinance every single month where we have five Sundays fall in the month. So if you're trying to figure out when in the world we are doing this, it's every single month where we have a fifth Sunday and we do it on that fifth Sunday. So know that coming up on Christmas Eve, we will um, have a communion here in our church. And it's important for us to prepare our hearts for that, isn't it? And so uh, make sure our hearts are well prepared and we're confessing our sin before the Lord and not only get to celebrate His birth in the beginning of a new year, um, but to be able to uh, think about that death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And so let's go ahead and take a look in our Bibles here. 2 Samuel chapter number 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9. This is an amazing chapter here in Scripture, Um, although it's not very long, only 13 verses long. It really shows us how good God is and considering the kindness um, of God. And I don't know if you've ever really considered how good God is to us and how kind He is, but we're going to talk about that today as we approach the celebration of our uh, birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So 2 Samuel chapter number 9, verse number 1, and David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? 
And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, and are in Lodabar. And so they recognize here that David is looking for an offspring um, of Saul. Um, and you remember that uh, Jonathan was David's very, very close friend. The Bible talks about how their souls were knit together um, as they served God. God together. Um, they're on two different ends of the kingdom, if you will. And David is finding himself in a place now where Saul has lost his life. Jonathan has lost his life. Uh, there was great turmoil in the land, but there is not any longer at this moment. And David is looking for some of the offspring of King Saul. And uh, he finds here, Jonathan has his son. So imagine this, his very best friend in the Lord has lost his life in battle. And David, I'm sure the Bible demonstrated to us that he was terribly grieved over the loss of one of his best friends. And after the battle of the Philistines here, David finds himself and he's looking for one that is related to Jonathan. You know, you might wonder, even within your own heart and mind, how another human being can show love and kindness to somebody else. Well, it's only through the love of God. You know, you consider your own life prior to receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior, and if you were anything like me, you didn't have a real consideration for others around you. You were focused on self. You were focused on accomplishing those things that you had set out to do in your very us um, as we got involved with that journey. But here, as we can see, David, with the love of God uh, bubbling up from his very own heart, wants to show God's love and God's kindness to those around him. Verse number five, then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of uh, Maker, the son of Amiel from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David. He fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he said, Behold thy servant. This is an interesting name, right? Anybody named their child Mephibosheth before? You ever hear that? Well, I heard it right here in the Bible. I don't know if there's been more after that. I'm sure there has been. But this one, Mephibosheth, is the son of Jonathan. David's very dear friend. And he seeks him out and he finds him. And you may wonder, this child that has come here, like, uh, who is this? Well, this is uh, Jonathan's son. And he's now standing before David. And actually, he's not standing before David, is he? He's there in front of David. But if we read on in verse number 7, And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake. And will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continuously. Verse number 8, And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Man, he didn't have a very high opinion of himself, did he? As he considers standing before the very king there... He views himself as a very low human being. And you might think, well, what in the world? How did that happen? Why, why would he be thinking such a thing? Well, first of all, he's there before the king, King David, isn't he? Verse number 10, Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits, and thy master's son shall have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. And we see this man Ziba here that had Mephibosheth under his uh, uh, area of responsibility. And, and uh, he has many sons and many servants himself. And this boy Mephibosheth, he wasn't well on his feet. In fact, the Bible says that he was lame on his feet. And you may wonder, well, how did this young boy end up being lame and not being able to walk? 
If we look back at 2 Samuel chapter number 4 and verse number 4, the Bible tells us who he is and what happened. Listen to what it says. And Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame of his feet. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel and his nurse took him up and fled. And so there was great turmoil in the land and the word comes there from the king, uh, Saul and his son, Jonathan, and the nurse goes to pick up this small five-year-old child and, and run off with him. And the Bible says that he fell and became lame and his name was Mephibosheth. You look at this young boy here, five years old, I consider even my, my grandchildren being right around that age, and others have grandchildren that are right around five years old, and man, a five-year-old is running around, aren't they? Jumping up and down, man, you gotta, you gotta keep them uh, calm if you can to stop them from jumping off the rooftop and anything else they can climb up upon. I remember my daughter as a young child, as she was in this age of even two, three, four years old, boy, we had to keep a tight look on her and keep her reined in because, and if, if we left the kitchen very long, she'd be standing on the countertops. She'd be trying to climb her way with the cupboards open, trying to use the shelves as footholds to climb up on top of the cupboards in the kitchen as a small child. And you know, a small child, they've got a lot of energy, don't they? And they're out there running around and you consider Jonathan's son. He's lame. He no longer has that privilege of running around, jumping as high as he can, making his way up the banister only to leap off and to laugh and to giggle. He's been lame since he's been five years old because of the turmoil that was in the land and the nurse and him fell down upon the ground as they ran. Must have been a pretty horrific injury. You know, you consider our modern medicine today we're lucky that God has blessed human beings with understanding of how to take care and to fix other human beings. I was watching some events unfold in a trauma room, in an emergency room, in a hospital, and sometimes people do not consider the great lengths that people will go to to save others. I watched a team of more than 15 people as they gathered in this trauma center in a hospital in Texas serving more than 300 emergency cases every single day. Now we know that a human being in our own, uh, in our own worth and our own knowledge, we can't do anything at this level in helping to, to save people from their very own death. But you know what? With God's help, he can give people wisdom, can he? He can give us knowledge. And here at this time when Mephibosheth was dropped upon the ground, his legs were broken and badly damaged. They weren't able to uh, get this young boy healed up to where he was able to use his legs anymore. Imagine the compassion that David must have felt on Mephibosheth as he considered his dear friend, Jonathan. As he considered his father, if you will, Saul, that took him in there to the castle, to the, to the king's palace. The love of God can only come from within us as we have trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior. And you know, there aren't many people out there that'll, that'll love on others around them. There aren't many that will uh, do deeds for those that are around them if they don't have the love of God within their own hearts. Romans chapter 2 and verses 3 and 4 says this, And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shall escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? That's a great thing. Aren't you satisfied today and overwhelmed with love and joy knowing that God led you to repentance? If you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you know for a fact that it wasn't of your own doing that you came to know Christ as your Savior. You were drawn by the Holy Spirit of God, weren't you? And he led us right to his altar 
so that we might be able to repent and cast our hearts before him as we cried out for a savior. God's kindness towards us is unmeasured. You remember what Matthew chapter 5 says, the, the Beatitudes. Verse number 6 says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. That's because of God's kindness and his goodness to us, word, isn't it? Verse number 7 says, Blessed are the merciful, so, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Aren't you glad to be called the child of the king today with the hope of eternity in mind? Verse number 10 of Matthew chapter number 5. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We consider God's great kindness to us even in the midst of all the challenges that we may face in this life here. God's kindness and love is still extended to us, isn't it? He is so very good. Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 11 says, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Isn't that an amazing time when that happens? Do you jump for joy when you have men revile you? We should, because we're blessed as a result, aren't we? As we stand as a child of the king, he is looking out for us in his great kindness. Exodus chapter 20 and verse number 6, these 10 commandments that we know so well are, are uh, mingled in here. In verse number 6, and the Bible says this, And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. God's mercy and his love towards us extends way beyond what we'd even consider. You know, even consider us at this time of year, Christmas time. Normally the love of God really makes itself known within the heart of a believer at this time of year as we consider the birth of his son, Jesus Christ. And we look at others that are out there that are maybe less fortunate and they don't have the things that we have and the, the cold weather that has come upon us and those that uh, don't quite have a, a, a home, a roof over their head to call home. Sometimes we're compelled to show the love of God towards them. But you know what? We ought to be compelled to show the love of God every day of every year, shouldn't we? Because God is so kind and so good to us and we cannot ever forget that. And David is simply showing God's great love as he extends that measure to Mephibosheth there, Jonathan's son. And he does everything within his power and his authority to show God's love to Mephibosheth. And we see the humility that Mephibosheth comes in as he says, man, what, why would you even consider me this, this dead dog, this low down, no good? I can't even walk. I can't even get around like other people. Why would you even consider me King David? But God's love is being extended towards this young man here. And it's awesome to see David man after God's own heart as he allows the kindness and God's love to overflow in his very own life and share that very love with those around him. And it wasn't like David didn't consider exactly what he was doing. I believe that God was speaking to David's heart in this entire matter as David sought out this young man. He sought out this young man to see if he can find one that was of the house of Saul. The Bible reminds us in Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 10, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Those are other believers in Jesus Christ, aren't they? God asks us to extend his love uh, to those that are around us. And he asks us to look for opportunities to do so. But he says we ought to especially do that to other believers. Amen. I remember many years ago meeting a, a man out in a desert community. 
as he was in a place in his life where he was homeless and he was addicted to alcohol and he couldn't, he couldn't exercise temperance in his very own life and he continued to fall down over and over and over again until he lost his entire family, lost his home, lost his business and, and was there on the streets in this desert community. And we met him at a gas station and not knowing that he was a believer in Jesus Christ, I just simply got out and began to talk with him and share the gospel with him as, as uh, others were, were gassing up the car there that, that we were in. And this man began to finish the very verses that I was giving to him. For God so loved the world, he goes on to say, that he gave his only begotten son. This man knew the scriptures inside and out. And what was more amazing was the fact that this man knew several people that I knew, yet I didn't know him. He attended Bible college with several people that attended the very same church that I was in. I was able to go back and look at an old college uh, yearbook and see this man's very picture in there, smiling and full of joy as he served the King of Kings. But yet he was found in this place where he was in complete despair and discouragement because he allowed his own life to unravel as he made bad decision after bad decision. But you know what? I thought about this verse here as I was talking with the man and as he shared with me that he was a believer. We stayed there for nearly an hour. We went into a small food place and bought food for him and for the other men that were there with us and just began to talk. And to be able to extend that kindness to others, it impacts them. It encourages them. I remember not even knowing this man myself personally, but yet sitting and weeping with him at a table over the heartache that he was dealing with in his very own life. And of course, God could bring us to that place where we can share his love with those around us. But you know what? We ought to do it, especially to those that are of the household of faith. Amen. And here, David is doing that very thing to Jonathan's son. And he sees Jonathan's son is lame here. And he says, man, we're going we're gonna to do some things for him. In fact, we're going to restore to him all the land that King Saul had acquired. Now, if you remember our studies that we've been through already, and I know we haven't been into a great deal of, of uh, Saul's kingdom, but boy, you know what? Saul was king over the children of Israel. He was the first king, wasn't he? And it was a great deal of land that Saul was given, that he controlled. And we consider that very uh, change in kingship as uh, David now came on the scene. You know, as David was named king, at first he wasn't named king over all of Israel. The land was still divided up. The 12 tribes uh, completely had still not come unto him and, and named him king. And yet he declares unto the uh, man Zeba here that is over Mephibosheth and those others that are there um, that they are going to restore to him all the land that belonged to Saul. And they're going to till the land for him. Mephibosheth didn't have the wherewithal to do it, did he? He didn't have all kinds of servants and everything around him, did he? But he soon would as David extended the love of God to him and declared that they would not only give him and restore him the land uh, that his grandfather Saul had had, but that they were going to till the land and they were going to uh, bring these things to pass. Let me read you verse number 10 of 2 Samuel 9 once again. And therefore thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him and thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. Eat. And you think, wow, that's just amazing to see all these people that are going to now be cared for because of the love of God that was extended to them. But David took it even one step further. He said, not only are we going to restore this land to Mephibosheth, and he's going to be the one that's going to be in charge. But he said, but Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. He brought him right into the king's court, right into his very own table. You know, God's done that for you and I. He's given us, every, every one of us, the opportunity to come and sup with him, hasn't he? 
He's invited us to come and dine with him as he cried out to us at that time when we first heard the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, come. And the man that will open his heart up as a door unto Jesus Christ, Jesus says, I will enter in. Amen. And as our Lord and Savior has come in and saved those of us that have trusted Christ as our Savior that are here today, you know what? He's given us a great love for his very own people, hasn't he? And David is extending that here and he's given them the land and he's, he's told other people that they're going to do the work and they're going to bring in the, the fruits and all the food and everything else. But uh, this particular young man, Mephibosheth, he's going to be at the king's table. He's going to be eating with me at my table. And Mephibosheth, he had a young son whose name was Micah. And all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. Now you remember as we first looked at this, Ziba was the one who was in charge, wasn't he? And yet King David comes and he makes this known unto him and he restores this great love that God has for each one of us. He, he blesses Mephibosheth immensely. You know, God can do that for us here. God can choose to change our lives in the, the drop of a pin, if you will, if he choose to. We look at this one, the son of Jonathan here, as he was here on the scene, he couldn't even care for himself because of the physical condition that he was in. But God cared for him, didn't he? And God chose to, at his very own moment, to elevate him also in the eyes of man and allow David to participate in this shedding of God's love on those around him. God is so very good. Exodus chapter 34 and verse number 6, I'm reminded, the Bible says this, And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Abundant in goodness and truth. Amen. God is so very good. He goes on to say in Exodus 34, verse 7, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. So although God is a great God of love, he does tell us there's only one way to get to heaven, doesn't he? It's through his son, Jesus Christ. He goes on visiting, or, or in verse number seven at the, the second part there, the Bible says this, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children under the third and the fourth generation. The sin of mankind does carry down the bloodline, doesn't it? But God's great mercy, he's extended it to all who will receive it. Just like the free gift of salvation, trusting in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, it is a free gift that each one of us have the privilege to receive, isn't it? But we've got to make the choice to receive that free gift. I don't know that we realize how good and how kind God really is to us as we go through our daily lives and you know, we get involved with our daily circumstances Psalm chapter 31, verses 19 through 21. Oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. Thou shalt hide them in a secret of thy presence from the pride of man. Thou shalt keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. Blessed be the Lord God. For he has showed me his marvelous kindness in a strong city. That's the God that we serve, isn't it? It's the God that has chose to draw close to us and give us the opportunity to draw close to him. Micah chapter 7, verses 18 through 20. Who is like, or I'm sorry, who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity? and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. 
This is the God that we serve that is kind beyond understanding for us. Verse number 19 says, He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. And thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Isn't that amazing to think that our very sins, as we confess them to God, God chooses to remember them no more. They're cast into the depths of the sea. They're, they're, uh, as far as the east is from the west, the Bible says, God chooses not to remember our sins anymore as we confess them to him. Verse number 20 of Micah chapter number 7 says, Thou will perform the truth to Jacob and the mercy to Abraham, which thou hast sworn unto our fathers from the days of old. It's the same God that we serve today, isn't it? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 45, Jesus himself says this, That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good. He sendeth the rain on the just and on the unjust. We sometimes want to look around us and think maybe God's love isn't extended to us as we thought it would be. Because we can look around and we can see even ungodly people get to experience some of those things that we experience here on this planet. And if we're not careful, we'll end up like that one Asaph mentioned in Psalm 73. Well, we'll start taking up our time with looking around at what other people are doing and their so-called prosperity and fall into discouragement and depression ourselves. God's kindness and his mercy extends to us and we cannot forget that. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 7, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. That's God's desire for our life to show us his kindness and his great love. And he works in and through that through his son Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus himself said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Even in this time of David as he's here extending the great love of God to mankind around him and of course to Jonathan's son Mephibosheth uh, here, God's love has extended towards his creation since the beginning of time. He's been good to us. He could have just wiped up this place and said, forget it. I'm not doing this. This bunch of low down, no good people. They never want to turn to me. They never want to follow me. But he's long suffering to us word, isn't he? And David, a man after God's own heart is demonstrating those very godly attributes as God has extended his love to David. Was David a sinless man? He was not a sinless man. David had sin in his life, just like you and I do. But in his great mercy, in God's great mercy, he extended his forgiveness to David as David came to him and asked God to forgive him of his sins. And God allowed him to stand back up on his feet and continue to move forward to do great things for God. A man known after God's own heart because he understood repentance. He understood how to get right with God. And here this very same David has a heart for God and he's, ex he's extending God's love to Jonathan's very own son. Verse number 11 of 2 Samuel chapter number 9, Then sent Ziba unto the king, according to all that the Lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. Aren't you glad you're a son of the king? Amen. If you're saved today, we can say, man, we're a son and daughter of the king of kings, the Lord of lords. Amen. And we get to sup at his table all the day long if we choose to walk with him and we choose to stay in that place, don't we? Verse number 13 of 2 Samuel chapter 9. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem. For he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. I find it interesting that God points it out in verse number 13 of this chapter 9 of 2 Samuel. 
that he ate at the king's table continually. But yet in the eyes of man, he was lame, wasn't he? And we can come and we can sup with the king of kings, but we've got to make the decision to go there. And it doesn't matter if you cannot physically walk or physically run or or physically jump. The, The throne room of grace is open to every single one of us that have trusted Christ as our Savior, isn't it? And even for those, when we come to that place and recognizing that we must receive Jesus Christ in order to uh, uh, take part in eternal life, we too, even as unbelievers, as so many of us at one point came and trusted him, entered into that very same throne room. God is so very good. He desires for us to extend his godly attributes of God's love to those around us. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32 says, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Aren't you thankful you're forgiven today? If you're a child of the King today, you know that you can execute 1 John 1, 9, where the Bible says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. And if there's somebody that's in here today, if there's somebody listening to this message today and you can't really understand how a king named David could extend God's love to this man that was lame and was was really no good by man's standard, couldn't even care for his own, but yet he was invited to dwell at the king's table continually. We need to come to a place where we admit that we're a sinner. The Bible says in Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's all of us, every single one of us. We had to have recognized that, that we're a sinner, we're low down, no good. Jeremiah 33, verse 8. I love this verse. Listen what it says. And I will cleanse them from all their iniquity. How much? All their iniquity. Whereby they have sinned against me. And I will pardon all their iniquities. Whereby they have sinned. And whereby they have transgressed against me. If we'll simply acknowledge that we are a sinner and admit that we are a sinner, God is going to be right there willing to receive us, isn't he? And we must, of course, believe in Jesus Christ. Not just simply believing and as I did as a young man and said, well, yeah, I believe in God. But I never took the time to confess that to him and ask his son to be my Lord and Savior. Jesus himself says in Matthew 16, 21, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again on the third day. That's the gospel in a nutshell right there. He came with a very specific purpose to go and to die for the sin of mankind, to take our punishment on himself and to be killed and to be buried in a tomb and to conquer death and to rise after the third day. Amen. Romans chapter 4 and verse number 5 says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. When someone comes to that place where they recognize that Jesus Christ is God's son and that he did go to the cross to pay the price for our very own sin and that he died and was buried and rose again after the third day, the Bible says by faith as we believe that, it's counted unto us as righteousness and we secure eternal life at that moment that we confess it to God. Romans 5, 8 says, but God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I'm so very thankful. That in spite of me, Christ still went to the cross knowing that I was low down, no good. Romans 5.12 says, Wherefore, wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. That's everybody, isn't it? Recognizing we're a sinner and believing in Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm so very thankful. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have an everlasting life. 
If someone's listening to this message today and you believe these very things that we've just mouthed about who Jesus Christ is, you have nothing left to do other than to call on him to save you. Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Verse number 10 says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It's not enough just to simply believe, but we've got to confess it to God Almighty and trust in His his Son, Jesus Christ, as our Lord and Savior. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Aren't you glad for that? I'm glad. I know that me as a low down, no good, heathen, God still went to the cross for me. And he still invited me in. He still invited me into his throne room to trust his son as my personal savior. If you're listening to this message today, I would encourage you to do just that. It's not enough to believe. You must confess with your mouth. Tell God that you believe who his son is and that you cry out and ask him to be your Lord and savior. And for those of us that are here as Christians today, we've already saved, we've already trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior. I would encourage us to look to 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 9 many times throughout the day. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's do that oft as we approach this next Lord's Day, Christmas Eve on Sunday, as we prepare for His communion. He's extended his great love and kindness to us. Amen. Amen. Share the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ with those around you. They'll probably wonder why in the world is this person being so nice. It's very easy for you and I to say, it's only because of the love of God. Let's pray. Father, you are a righteous father, all-knowing, all-powerful, so very thankful that you have taken human beings, your creation under your wing, Lord, and given us an opportunity to be reconciled back to you. If there's anybody that's here today, Lord, that it does not know your son, Jesus Christ, as Savior, I pray that you would convict their hearts. Help them to come to a place, Lord, where they'd be willing to confess that you did send your only begotten son to this world to die for the sin of mankind conquering the grave, resurrecting on the third day. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. Bless as we go out throughout the remainder of this day. Help us to show your great love and kindness to those around us. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.